welcome to the Independent Artist Podcast, sponsored by the National Association of Independent Artists. Also sponsored by Zapplication. I'm Will Armstrong, and I'm a mixed media artist. I'm Douglas Sigworth, glassblower. Join our conversations with professional working artists. Hey, welcome back to the podcast. Douglas, you've made record time coming back from art in the high desert and in your big travels west. How are you, sir? I'm I'm tired, man. It was yeah. like we got our way out there after several shows. We worked our way all the way to the, practically to the West Coast. And then when we turned around to come home and realize how far away we were, that was a long one. It was three solid days in the van. Oof, that's brutal. That's a lot of time in the van. That's a lot of time together. And then you guys are going to jump right back into the studio together, too. Do you ever, does that, does that, how's that work out for the Sigworth glass? It would be fine if it wasn't going to be like a million degrees this weekend. Yeah. So it's going to be a little bit of a of a tough weekend trying to get stuff made to fill in the holes to to get off to St. Louis, which is the next For sure. one. I'm a couple hours north of you, and I'm dealing with 97. Uh, it's about mm. 94 tomorrow and 97 on Sunday, and it doesn't let up for the rest of of the week until really we we start to go down there. And 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 what the streets of St. Louis are going to feel nice and cool at a at a, a nice chilly 89. <laughs> it's, that it's looking like it's going to be next weekend. But, yeah, oh my um, gosh. Yeah, I I don't know how to do it. I I'm, I'm looking for a little advice here because I am in a a metal box with no AC and a, the flies have gotten bad again. Mm. How do you what do you guys do as far as like I know you guys are are fighting the heat constantly with your furnace, but do, what do you just stay up all night? We go to bed early, early to bed and early to rise, so we try and get up at like well, What's early? Uh, 6. What? 6. We go to sl- yeah, before the sun goes down, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that we can be up at three during these hot spells. During, you know, especially at the end of summer here, we have to we have to do huh. that. I can't do it. I'm gonna do. Um, I you know I I'm a parent. You're a parent. We know how mm-hmm. it is to feel terrible. So I'm just gonna feel terrible. I'm gonna okay. go. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm probably gonna get up at three, but I will do the wolf thing and just take some some naps. I'll work until like two. And then I'll yeah. take a nap. I don't know. Figure it out. Maybe I just won't work. Yeah. I don't like my work right now. <laughs> I'm, in, oh, no. I'm deep in the self-loathing phase. So um, I don't know. We oh. all go through that, but I'm I'm dealing with that. So I'll break out of it somehow. But man, it's it's some tough times out in the studio right now. It's hard when it's like the elements are fighting against you and you got to get through that. I mean, when it's crunch time, you kind of want to be able to just... It would be nice if things just started happening really like smoothly and and exactly sure. the way you want them, but there's always these like stumbling blocks. Right. Yeah, I've got a neighbor right now. I had to I had to care an out on her and oh, um, did you? tell her to stop burning green wood right next to my studio. Like a tree fell or something? No, no. She a, a live tree, like a live tree. You know, not okay. aged, sitting upright. She is trying to burn it down. Chainsaw didn't work or doesn't have a chainsaw. Um okay. so I went over and yelled at her and um <laughs> I yeah. I, I did. I did some yelling. I In got your I got strong in way. <laughs> uh yeah. I, I, I got a little uh yeah, I got a little red with her. Um Okay. So anyway, uh, it's time to move back to Santa Fe. <laughs> there you it's go. It's time to leave. Yeah. Oh, man. I've had enough summer. Hey, have you ever done this? This is something that never happened to me before on the way home uh, from out west. But uh, Renee's driving, and I'm thinking we've got about another hour in us. So I am on my phone, and I'm looking for a hotel an hour away from us. Yeah. I booked it, non-refundable. Even like a Holiday Inn Express was like 189 or something God. crazy like that. Yeah, they're gouging right now, right? It's ho- totally. awful. Totally. So I book it, feel good about it, and then I hit the maps to to drive to it, and I realize I have booked the hotel an hour behind me. <laughs> no. And not an hour That's ahead of me. Horrible. We've all checked into hotels at six or eight o'clock at night, and the hotel clerk isn't answering the phone it's just ringing off the hook mm. so i couldn't call and get them to refund my non-refundable night but anyway it worked out we ended up getting our, our money back and booked something further up but that was an interesting uh experience on the road yeah i've done i've i've booked um 
Uh, wrong weekends for sure. Mm. I, I've done typically. I've done that uh, that one of a kind show in Chicago, and I booked the wrong weekend. And by the time I went around to booking it, it was like, yeah, sorry, everything is like three hundred dollars a night. It's not gonna oh. not gonna work out for you. So damn. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, we've all done dumb things. Uh, I've never sure. done this. I was trying to remember who had, who had told me this, but um, I can't. It's such a bonehead move. I don't want to name them by name. I am remembering who it was. Okay. But uh, they they went, they showed up at Winter Park a week early. Oh. There was like, it was one of those years where it was like there was a week between Gasparilla and then there's an off week and then there's Winter Park and they okay. just drove up. They stayed all week and went over to Winter Park and they're like, how come nothing's here mapped out on the street yet? That's. Everybody, when are they going to close the streets? Well, they're going to close them next weekend. Smart guy. That's but one of anyway. those. That's definitely an art fair nightmare showing up early oh, yeah. or late. Alcohol's a hell of a drug. <laughs> <It is. laughs> All right. Well, s- speaking of other art fair nightmares, have you ever had an art fair nightmare that you get locked into the art fair and you can't get out? I've gotten locked out in my nightmares where I'm like, I can see the show going on and I can't get my thing through and I got to walk it through like a, I don't know, dolly through a restaurant or a mall. Um, But no, I've never gotten locked in. Well, that happened at a show that the show we were just at, at Art in the High Desert. Chris Dahlquist and and Kyle Dahlquist, (laughs) they were volunteering as board members to laying out the show the first night. You know, before the artists show up. Yeah. But then they could stay and set up their own booth. Well, everyone had left who was on the board. The head of the show (laughs) came by and said, I'm going to be sure you're out by this time because it's going to get locked. Well, they didn't realize he's the one who's actually locking it. So when they went to the gate to leave, they can't get out. And this fairgrounds is huge. So they're like walking the whole perimeter, hoping they can find an area to get through. Find a weak spot. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, So leave it to say that these two ended up scaling the fence to get out. (laughs) No way. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) They scaled the fence. There's there's no way that David Bierstrom doesn't have that on video somewhere. There's some surveillance that that he and Carla are sitting back watching and laughing. Uh, But no, that's uh, there's there are no kinder people than than Chris and Kyle Dawkins. So absolutely. I'm sorry. That happened to those guys, but that's hilarious. We are laughing with you, Chris and Kyle, with you, not at you. <laughs> Douglas was laughing at. That's that was really rude, Douglas. I know. <laughs> that's amazing. So uh, you brought up art in the high desert. Any anything else you'd like to share? And it's been several years since that that show has has happened. the The board of directors and and David did a great job putting it all together. Uh, crowds sure. were good. They were. They were carefully curated, so to speak. You know what I mean? Some people who came were buyers. You know, I find that in a lot of kind of resort towns, Mm -hmm. you know, these resort town shows that, that, that happen sometimes, whether it's like Jackson or even Sun Valley, where the attendances are not necessarily all of that. So I don't know that the attendance is is there at that kind mm-hmm. of show to mm-hmm. for everybody to have a big weekend, but um, it's worth it. The audience is well healed enough that there are, you know, those big fish just, just swimming around, you know, sharks infest the waters. We did have a couple of those big fish sales, so it worked out for us. So I'm really grateful that they did that. Well, they brought it back from the dead. They sure did. And I have a lot of faith that it's at a good footing, that it's going to have a future. So I, I'm really happy about all that. Plenty to plenty to grow on there. And, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So there's this one other story I wanted to tell about the show that we might get a kick out of. So you know how everybody has been having trouble with their vans lately? Oh, it seems yeah. like it's been kind of a theme. It seems like a, a pandemic of van issues for sure. Definitely. So a uh, good friend, Anthony Hansen, guest mm. from last season, pulls into the show, turns off his van, goes back to turn it on later to start his van, and it won't start. Oh, jeez. So that. what he came to realize after a series of phone calls to mechanics and all that, that he, uh, when he pulled into his parking spot, it was at a slight angle, and he actually was just out of gas. What a rookie move! Come on, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Right. Poor bastard. So uh, he, he happened to win an award on Sunday. And so in his in his award speech, he said to everybody, if you ever break down, 
first step that everyone should do is to make sure you check and see if you got <laughs> enough gas in the tank. <laughs> all right, Anthony, keep gas in your tank. Uh, all the rest of you, I don't know if you've ever run into that problem. I do push it to the limit from time to time. Yeah. I was driving um, quick stories. I got stuck. There is a gas station, gosh, on the way to back to Santa Fe and you cut across like you're driving like a good three hours without a gas yeah. station and you're going through the middle of the desert and the first gas station you hit if you have to stop there mm -hmm. it's going to charge you like 650 a gallon so yeah, gotcha. I, I've come close but um, basically just eating eating pride for not filling up before I hit that three hour stretch but I've never we've never pulled an Anthony uh, no. so don't pull an Anthony out there we've got a new <laughs> uh, new catchphrase here buddy I'm sorry pull, we're gonna have to do that to you pull an Anthony yeah <laughs> yeah hey uh, the good people at Zapplication asked us to talk about something this week Douglas you got the email there what do you what do they uh, what, do, what do they have here for well, us well I'm sure a lot of us have gotten that email about uh, a survey so Zap wants to to put out a, a survey so that they can know, you know, what they can do better, what our experience is as art festival artists, just so they can, you know, improve their services and, you know, hear our point of view. Exactly. They're always growing. They're always changing the product that they are offering to shows as well as to us. The survey is going to help them know what to focus on in the future and provide mm -hmm. insight into what it's like to be uh, one of us at festivals and art fairs. So it should not take you too long, about five minutes to complete. And they have a carrot. They got a little carrot for us. I need a carrot. What's the carrot? The carrot is um, by taking the survey, we are entered in for a drawing for a $50 Visa gift card. So ah, all right. So we got the fifty dollar uh, Visa gift card uh, is something, but to be honest, it's just more important to try to have your say. Well, you know what? Uh, they had me at tell me what you think. All right. All right, that's true. They're really hoping to get a good response rate this year so that they can share some insights with the whole community on the state of things. It's going to be open for another two to three weeks. So if you're able uh, to get into Zap and, um, you know, uh, fill it out. I will drop the URL into the episode notes so you can just... Uh, open up the episode notes and click on the link. It'll take you directly to the survey. All right. So the, uh, let's get right into it, my friend. You have a great talk coming up. Uh, let, let's let you set it up here. It's a, a monster in our industry and a, an incredible uh, glass artist this week. That's true. She's had a very big presence that I have I've admired over the years. So I'm glad I've had the chance to sit down and kind of pick her brain and find out what it's like being her. So Marlena Rose. Marlena Rose is our guest today, sand cast sculptor, glass artist from Clearwater, Florida. This episode of the Independent Artist Podcast is brought to you by Zap, the digital application service where artists and art festivals connect. Well, sometimes I'm in a real hurry and I just love that I have things that are saved in Zap to streamline my process. To that end, Douglas, one of my tricks with Zap is to favorite all of the shows that I'm even remotely considering. That way I can filter them all and then look at all the deadlines at once. But then there's other times when I have a little more time on my hands and I'm looking into other shows and I want to get to know about the show and all the information is right there in the prospectus with links to the website. I can see who the artists are that have participated in the past. You know, that's a great idea, Douglas, because one of the ways that I was finding shows at the very beginning was to go online and see who I felt my work looked good with. It's just great that all that information is organized and easy to look over when planning our next show season. Marlena Rose, welcome to the Independent Artist Podcast. I'm so happy to see you. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is fantastic. It was fun seeing you out in Sun Valley. I um, know. We were both out there together. With that gorgeous weather. Did you guys get to enjoy some of the mountain time while you were out there? A little bit. Not too much. We just came bit. in, did the show, and left. But we did have some time. Okay. Well, I know you have two daughters. Were both daughters there or just one? Just the one. Okay. The other one is back. was back at school for preseason soccer. Okay. So it was a little family time. I, I saw some of your social media. It looked like you guys are all at least having good family time on the road. Yes, <laughs> definitely. We love getting out of Florida. Well, speaking of Florida, I don't want to ignore the fact that we're recording just a few days after the hurricane came through your area. So how is everything? How are you guys doing? Well, thankfully, we live on a little bit of a hill. 
the only hill really in Clearwater. So we were fine. It was minimal. We had hardly any wind or rain, but I guess the tides just came up. And so everybody that that lives on the water was having some issues that I know of. Mm. A lot of people were flooded. Mm. Is your studio and gallery also located where you're talking about up on a hill? Um, it was downtown, and every everything was fine. It, mostly, everywhere was fine, other than areas that ha- that are on water. Mm-hmm. So we are not on my gallery, nor my warehouse, nor my house. So it's always a bit tense this time of year. Yeah, right. Living so close to where the hurricanes come in. Living on the edge. That's just that's everything. That's my life. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, I I think we've been kind of running in the same circles here for a number of years. And I've always kind of, you know, looking from the outside in towards you, I've always perceived this kind of this big presence, this big kind of operation. And it, it, does it feel that way from within? Do you feel that way about your own art practice and about what you do? Well, Definitely, I have help, and that makes it so it's it's easier to, you know, be an artist. I do have a lot of help. I'm in many places at the same time, so mm-hmm. it's really the only way that I can do that. So I've had help ever since the beginning. I realized my uh, strengths and weaknesses, and administration was definitely not one of my strengths. So mm-hmm. I knew that I needed help to be organized. And right from the get-go, I had somebody helping me because both Thomas and myself are not that. (laughs) So I've always had the idea of getting help and not doing everything myself, even though I say that, but I'm, I am definitely in charge of everything and everything is, comes through me and I read every email and I'm involved in everything. So yes and no, because I'm, I still have my hand in everything. I think that we do on some levels as artists feel that kind of like we, we have to come to terms with what we can and what we can't do and to be okay with delegating, you know, obviously not in the creative aspect, but there's so many other aspects to running an art business that is just like, it's impossible to do all of it you know, to to have your, I obviously you oversee all of it, but you can't do the accounting. You can't do the, you know what I mean? All the, all the minutia that keeps the wheel rolling. Yeah. And I think that, I guess if I were to do everything, which I could, I'd probably be very small. Like maybe I'd have one gallery representing me or, mm. you know, I just, I just don't think that I would be doing the volume that I'm doing or, or that I like to do. So Mm -hmm. I think that would be the difference. I mean, administration, I've learned how to deal with it and I know know how to understand it and and Mm. do it myself. But I think that's probably the key to any business is being able to step in and wear the hats as necessary and and know how to do everything so that you you can get help. Well, part of that big presence uh, that I, I perceive anyway, is you've got your hand in, you know, the art fairs, the in-person events, you've got like gallery galleries, and then you've got like the store galleries, and then you've got your own gallery. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what you all have out there that showcases your work? Yeah. So I have roughly a dozen galleries who represent me nationally and internationally. I have, yeah, I do the art fairs going to be doing Art Basel, actually Art Miami, particularly mm. this this fall. And um, and then we opened the Marlena Rose Gallery in Clearwater, more just as a, an office. But then I decided when I was looking around, the space came available that was in downtown Clearwater and this beautiful 1920s building with brick. And I thought, wow, that this, this is a really nice place to work. And and then I thought it would probably help the downtown bring people there to come see me. So, you know, it was kind of a win-win situation. But yeah, we opened that gallery about nine years ago. Okay. Nine years. Wow. 
So I sometimes get that area. I mean, I think of the greater area like Tampa, Clearwater, uh, St. Petersburg. And aren't there a number of kind of glass hubs in that area? Like, you know, you've got some Chihuly galleries and Duncan McClellan. Yeah, no, it's turned into, we call it the glass coast. Mm. Yeah, there's so much activity happening in, in my area. Uh, started with the Chihuly Museum in St. Petersburg. Um, and then Duncan McClellan and I used to work in the same studio. And then he went out and started his own thing. And that's really been incredible for the community. And then mm -hmm. um, the Imagine Museum happened a few years ago, which shows the Studio Glass movement, the history of the Studio Glass movement. So most people who know about Chihuly, that's who they think of when they think of glass. Now right. they have a context of, you know, all the people doing incredible things with with glass from the 60s onward, most of the artists being alive today. So that was exciting. I helped the benefactor put that museum there. I connected her with the collection. And I feel like it's probably been my best I guess, matchmaking that I've okay. ever done because nice. it really has helped so many artists and our community to to understand what's happening right now in the Studio Glass movement. That's interesting because, you know, not a lot of people know that the Studio Glass movement is fairly recent. I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, obviously people think, well, Chihuly and, you know, he kind of put glass on the map, but there were a number of players involved that got us to to where we are now. Do you exactly. want to speak a little bit on that? Yeah, people, that's been one of my biggest purposes in all of this. I guess the greater purpose is to educate people on the Studio Glass movement that is happening right now. And it's very exciting. It's like this explosion of creativity with this spectacular medium that's been around forever, but mostly seen in um, blown work uh, throughout. Mm -hmm history and people started experimenting with glass more sculpturally in the 60s with Harvey Littleton being one of the founders of the studio glass movement and he started playing around with glass more sculpturally and and then it just started this attention on the material as as not only a craft medium but a medium to communicate an idea and so when I learned the technique that I do in the 80s, the early 80s, I found out later that the technique was new for glass. It was um, based on an ancient metal casting technique that has been around for thousands of years, and glass has been around for thousands of years. And um, But the union of doing this technique in glass just happened in, in the late 70s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. So when I realized that, that I was doing something that was new and different and pioneering this particular method of, of working, I was like, wow, what else is going on? And then I educated myself on all the different ways that people since the 60s have been playing around with glass as a sculptural medium. And I find this to be very exciting because it's happening now. And mm -hmm. most of the artists are still alive. And most people, like you said, think of Glass and Dale Chihuly. And he put glass as a as a medium to communicate an idea on the map, but that's all most people know. So with this museum, it's so educational as to all the different ways that you can work in glass. And I, I find it fascinating. So when you were first exposed to glass, was it glass blowing or was casting always your entry point and, and what you knew right away? Well, what's what's funny is that I was getting my Bachelor of Fine Arts and I couldn't decide what medium I wanted to focus my attention. I really love painting and sculpting. Mm. And I avoided the glass department because it intimidated me. First off, I saw a lot of... Why is that? Why did it intimidate you? I just you? <laughs> thought it was so physical and dangerous and, right. you know, you know, traditionally is, a, is male dominated. And I just thought, mm -hmm. well, I don't know how strong I am. And I don't know if it's, it's for me because I, I never was interested in, in 
throwing pots and ceramics. I was always interested in the sculpture side of it. So glass mm. to me equals glass blowing. So I, that that never interested me to take the class. But then eventually I said, okay, it's the only class that I haven't taken. All right. So I decided to try it. And what was funny was the professor, uh, Gene Koss, who is still there, I think it's his last year, and he taught the class very much um, from the idea of sculpture. He was he had a, a ceramics background, and so he was got interested in glass too because of the mm-hmm. experimental nature of all these new ways that people were working in glass sculpturally. So his approach was very unusual at the time in the early eighties. His approach was more sculptural, but he did start with glass blowing. He taught it for a few days. And then he gave just as much time to all the other techniques that he knew about, okay. one of them being the sand casting, which he had just started playing with. He heard about people experimenting in Sweden with it. So he went to the levee, he grabbed some sand, and he started playing with it. And that's when I learned it. So very, very new. And he was just like figuring it out and and that's kind of an interesting environment because it's like anything goes. Everyone's kind of you're learning as you go and getting excited about, oh, how this happened or that happened. And it's a truly inspirational moment. Completely. And that's what I find interesting is when you don't know anything, you have no limitations. Yeah. So it was interesting, like just one example of just what you're saying. I had no real, I was not a scientist scientific person or I didn't have mm-hmm. a real, you know, background in chemistry and physics. And so, you know, I didn't really think about anything other than I have this idea and I want to do it. So mm. I we went a lot to scrapyards. He loved going to scrapyards and finding cool metal objects and incorporating them in, in his sculptures. And and then I was influenced by that. And then um since you're in New Orleans, there was a lot of um levees and trains and I saw these beautiful railroad spikes and Mm. I thought, wow, this is such a gorgeous shape. I wonder Mm. if I could just put that in my my glass. And he's like, oh, there's no way. This is solid steel. You know, the compatibilities Mm -hmm. of the two, it'll never work. I was like, okay, well, I'll just try it and then maybe I'll get a picture out of it. Right. Maybe it'll last for a week and then it'll crack and break, right? (laughs) But I'll get that picture. Sure, um, exactly. So I did it, and for some reason, they all came out, and they lasted. And so we tried to figure out why that was, and we thought maybe the rust on it was a buffer. But stuff like that, he was shocked, you know, like, there's no way that that should work, and it it worked. And so there was just a lot of, you know, anything goes. Like you said, I mean, I, I cast into a submarine door, like I... We just kept ladling and late, and he was like, "Yeah, that's that's a great idea." And wow. um, so I made this piece that was poured into a submarine door, and then I ended up presenting it in the submarine door. But stuff like that, you know, like I'd see a submarine door in the scrapyard, and I'd say, "Wow, that's a great shape. Wonder if I could use it as my mold." And he's like, "Yeah, why not? Try it." I mean, he was so much like that, like just like no limitations. Whatever. Yeah, no limitations. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. was. An incredible professor, still is. Mm, That's cool. I mean, when glass kind of hit the universities, that time frame, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and today, I guess, but it made it accessible. It it made it so that we could have the movement. You're talking about the studio glass movement as it is and as as we see it today. Yeah, I feel so fortunate, you know, because some people today are like, oh, you don't need school. You can you know, it's just not as big of a deal going to college. It seems like that it was for me and my parents. And anyway, it's just different viewpoints on that. But for me, it's like, if I did not go to school, I would not be doing what I'm doing today if I was not educated. Mm -hmm. So it's super important to me to be that exposure, you know, having those opportunities that you can, you never would have, like, I never would be a glass artist. I know that for sure. My husband says, oh, you would have found it. But I, I really don't think that would have happened. I would have gone another direction for my my life. And it's just interesting how 
how that one class can change your life and and your path. So I'm so appreciative of that. I say that a lot on the show, on the podcast here, that, you know, I've got 20-year-old kids and they are trying to figure things out by anticipating which direction they're going to go based on the current knowledge that they have. And my wife and I are, are constantly saying to them, you don't know what kind of unexpected spark is going to arise at any given time. So you need to really follow the things that, that interest you. That spark sent you down a road. And look at this career you have. Yeah. And let me tell you, it was not easy. Mm-hmm. I learned the technique. And I just, it, it just clicked with every single aspect of my personality from, you know, I love to draw, sketch the idea. I love sculpting. Um, I was really into sports and adrenaline mm-hmm. and I, I loved, you know, crazy stuff. Like I love jumping out of airplanes and mm-hmm. speed. I, I jump horses and I just like anything adrenaline. So who would have known that this, you know, like I said, I was intimidated by for some reason, glass blowing, and that it changed my life. But it's funny. And, you know, when I learned it, it was absolutely, it just, I knew that this is what I should be doing. And I was having real success at school. And then in New Orleans, I went and just went to some galleries and I asked them what they thought, more just of like a critique. And I got picked up by a just incredible gallery and had a show as a student. Um, I was still in college. I was a senior. We sold everything. I had a great write-up. And I was like, okay, this is my life. And I was like, that's it. And then I graduated college and I was like, okay, now what? I know what I'm right. doing. I know what I want to do, but where do I do this? You and, know, and how do you do it? I mean, and how do I do it? There was no no, no path because you know I couldn't just go to a glass blowing studio in the 80s and say, I want to, you know, throw some ladles into sand, which is super messy. I want to take up your cooling ovens for roughly a week. Yeah, <laughs> you don't right. need them, do you? <laughs> no, I mean, for us, our annealing time, we will have an oven full of blown glass and it's like a 12 hour cycle. Your annealing cycle, how long you said weeks? No, it, well, it can be with the bigger pieces, but typically about a hundred hours, which is roughly six days. So yeah, about that would week. be like, <laughs> it's like my ovens are tied up that long and I can't put other work in there to, to anneal. No, no, no way. So, that was, <laughs> so right there was exactly yeah. the problem I was running into. So I was like, okay, I'll go to graduate school because that's what art students do. They, they go to graduate school. Okay. And so I went to graduate school thinking I'd be able to just make work, which is really all I wanted to do because I, I found what I wanted to do. Yeah, and, right. Um, and so nothing wrong with learning more and I was was happy with that but as a graduate student you know I was thinking I was going to make a lot of work but it was a blowing facility that I went to I went to CCA when the sculptor had just arrived on the scene so you know change takes a little time so I thought it, immediately I'd be able to make a ton of work turns out it was once a week I was able to make my work and teach at the same time mm-hmm. so it was kind of a waste and so I just decided to leave and, you know, was super frustrated and I didn't know how to follow this path. And, you know, it took me almost a decade before I convinced um, the studio where I'm at now that I was legit. I was for real. I mean, I'm in my early 20s. And mm-hmm. like you said, is I'm going to take up your ovens. You're not going to be able to make your own work. When you sand, it's going to be messy. Glass blowers don't like that. And starting out, it's not like a painter. You know, the 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 cost of building and having the equipment for our, your own personal studio, it's almost like the way to get there is to rent time from another studio until you have invested enough that you can start building your own equipment or buying your own equipment or whatever. So you were kind of in that tough period of how do I actually get to the end game of being able just to produce my work the way I want? That's so right. Because the studio, at least for what I need, you start at like $100,000 to put it mm-hmm. together. So there's that's prohibitive to anybody who's just gotten out of college. There's exactly. just no way. They're so right. you have to find a place to rent. And I found this gentleman that I 
that I really liked. And, but he, he didn't want me. So he, he came up with some huge figure that he could build me some equipment. Mm -hmm. And so again, I was just so deflated, but I had the number that he said, and I started working and doing other things. And eventually seven years later, I saved the money and I said, okay, I'm ready. And he, he was kind of testing me because he said, okay, well, you can use my equipment, but we'll put this money towards you renting the studio. And that's how we started working together. But I think he wanted to know that I was serious. I wasn't just... Yeah, like like next week, you're going to move on to a different medium of some kind. Cause this right, is and I've hard. ruined all his... <laughs> Right, right, and I've ruined all of his equipment in the meantime. And <laughs> and it's not just taking up that annealing oven. You glass casters, you soak through pots of glass like it's just like drinking water. It's just like dumping the glass. And you know, glass blowers can make our supply last a lot longer. But when you're going for those solid cast pieces, you go through glass like crazy. <laughs> yeah. And one day I will pour roughly 400 pounds of glass. That's <laughs> a insane. Whole, a whole crucible. Is that is that the whole size of your what your uh, furnace will hold is 400 pounds? Yeah. So it's like about 350 pounds if we leave like a little layer at the bottom. But yeah, yeah, so it's a lot of glass that we go through. It's taking up the whole studio. Like you're yeah. in there. So there's days where that other person in the studio wouldn't be able to use use it. So you have to have a very particular type of studio that a caster and a blower could work in, which would be large <laughs> mm -hmm. with a lot of cooling ovens and a number of furnaces. So I eventually found the place and it's been fantastic. He's He's been so helpful and and it's been a great, great partnership. I, I work, you know, I've been working steadily for the last 20 something years, mm. never taking a break. You know, in the summers we take a break for hurricane season, but pretty much every year I work from November-ish to May, June, and sometimes into the summer if I really have a lot of commissions. Yeah, that's a, that's a common question people ask glass people is like, you know, do you kind of produce work in seasons or periods? And we're like you, for the most part, we are like 24-7 year-round furnaces running and except for maintenance type stuff. But yeah, we're, we're constantly turning it out, you know, it's it's a... yeah. It's a race. <laughs> it feels like a race sometimes. Yeah, you can't. People say you can't just turn it off when you're done. I'm, and I said no, because you'll ruin, you'll ruin the the equipment if you turn it on and off. Usually, so mm -hmm. it's just running for a year, two years, <laughs> or when you need to do the maintenance. So mm -hmm. there's so much energy and expense in making the glass pieces. Mm -hmm. A lot of the conversations, you know, between different art mediums and stuff is especially with glass folks, it is, it's how do we get over that hurdle of getting to a place where we can make the work that we want to make? You know, that is such a huge thing. Tony Cray and I had a, a conversation a couple of years back in his episode, you know, talking about how he, he built himself the most inexpensive, Expensive framework, metal framework. Um, I forget the name of what he called it, but literally, we kind of have to do it in these weird kind of steps. You know what I mean? Until we can kind of arrive at the the right kind of space to do what we want to do, and then things get a little easier. You know, a little easier. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> then it's like, how do we sell it? You know, all the, all the other things you have to figure out as an artist, but really just getting to the point where you can make the work is its own kind of stumbling block. Totally. And I feel like, you know, people use, well, they still do. They ask, is it tough to sell the work? Is it tough to let go of it? And I feel like it really is difficult, but I think it was more difficult when I really didn't have a way to make the work. So you kind of hold on to it like this is it. But mm. once I started, you know, being able to consistently make the work as much as I needed to, then it was easier to let it go and know that it was going to a good home and people who really appreciate it. See, I never had a problem with that 
considering the fact that, you know, our gas bill, electric bill for running these studios is astronomical. Right. I'm like, okay, this is going to pay the bills, right? <laughs> totally. Please go. <laughs> Please go. Please go so I can keep the keep this uh, train on its track. <laughs> right. Oh, my gosh. Totally. Well, let me ask you. So we find ourselves here kind of in a time in history where gender roles are kind of getting thrown out the window for the most part. And it's good and it's refreshing. But neither you or I grew up in that. So did you ever find that coming up the ranks, working in glass, that being a five foot, what, three, five foot two woman, did you ever come across any of the barriers that maybe the guys in a in a male dominated field, you know, might kind of want to push you aside or, or what was that like for you? Definitely felt that for sure, when I took the class at Tulane. And then again, you know, when I approached the studio where I was, where I eventually worked, is it just from the appearances, Mm -hmm. you know, I I don't feel like I was taken seriously. You know, I just, Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I, it's a feeling you have. But I think that, you know, once things started going well, and I had some success, you can try to push somebody down or be negative, but mm. you know if you're doing okay, you can stand proud and just say whatever. <laughs> you found a way around. You know it made yeah. you maybe more resilient. Yes. Um, not that it makes it. It's hard to be appreciative of the folks who maybe put stumbling blocks in our way, but it is part of the path. You know, for, for sure. a lot of us, it's the obstacles that that get us to the other side of what we want to do. Totally. For every difficult situation, I feel like you set up ways in which you handle those situations and then you're better on the other side that you can predict those Mm -hmm. uh, moments and then you know how to handle it and avoid it or confront it or whatever it is. But I do think that 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 definitely in the 80s, for sure, was not taken seriously. And I think if I can just maybe put a little bit of my own perception or my thoughts on the matter, that, you know, perhaps the thought that, well, if you're female in this industry, that you need to do it all. You need to go in with the ladle and you need to scoop up that heavy ladle and dump it into the sand to create the form that you've laid out and all that stuff. But I'm sure that when those physical limitations come in, you can realize that the person just scooping the ladle isn't the artist. You know, they're the they're the muscle, but the creative is what you're doing. And so that is the forefront of the creation of the art. And we can let go of those kind of like, well, do I have to do it all? Do I personally have to have my hands on that ladle for me to be considered the artist? That's so true. And that is something that in the beginning, when I was young and <laughs> a little bit more, I guess, strong, I would say. I I mean, I'm pretty strong now, but it's, yeah, you get smarter. And I did have that viewpoint that I needed to do everything. Mm. And I did do everything, like I said, from ladling to the welding to every single part of it. Um, but then I realized that you know, I'm not going to make it <laughs> physically. Physically, right. Um, You'll have a like a five-year career, 10-year career, and your body will be burnt out. Totally. I mean, one of the assistants in the studio got a hernia from throwing around big ladles. And I just, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's very physical. So it's not that I can't do it. And it's not that I don't like to just keep my hand in it for fun, because it is fun. But mm-hmm. Really, like you say, the artwork is in the molding, in the ideas, in creating the idea. So that Mm -hmm. all happens, you know, before when I make the mold, during when I'm making the sand mold, Mm -hmm. and every aspect of it, like the pouring, I feel like it's just very mechanical. It's just dumping the glass in a hole. So to me, I would rather preserve my back Mm -hmm. (laughs) for the eight hours that I'm over a mold, you know, fiddling and getting it exactly right, as opposed to the hour and a half that it takes to pour the glass into the the mold and put it away. And you're involved in the pouring in the sense that 
at least what I've seen from, you know, what you have out there for videos is, you know, with torching and directing and cutting with the casting shears, you're still in there getting hot. You're not like, <laughs> come back an hour later and say, is it done yet? <laughs> no, you're in there doing it. You're just not the grunt who's carrying those ladles across the studio. Yeah, it would be virtually impossible because of the volume. Like I said, the 350 pounds that we pour in a day, you know, if if I'm over the mold for eight hours and then I'm pouring for an hour and a half, I'd be dead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, yeah, I think that it's it, at a certain point, you know, I just like to be smart about things and mm -hmm. make sure that I'm healthy. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of us uh, who work with glass, we fall in love with that initial kind of like the molten fluid material. That That's kind of that adrenaline hook that you were talking about. But then there is a kind of a different kind of a love that we have for when it's finished. You know, like glass has a kind of a magic quality about it, in my opinion. Can you describe that? kind of dichotomy between the different states, what makes it so seductive for you? Oh, that is such a good question. I think, like you said, from every single aspect of it, I mean, the adrenaline, like you say, I think that it definitely attracts the people who work in glass because it's so dangerous that, you know, it definitely lifts you up and it, it you know, it's like exercise when you're in that zone. And mm -hmm. but when I feel like you 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 could really hurt yourself, you could die, you could be seriously <laughs> injured. Um, it it really keeps you on your toes, and something about that, I don't know, is kind of is addictive. It's actually an addictive thing that every glass blower, glass artist, will if they hear this, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It's just something mm -hmm. that I feel it. You feel it, and. And so that's what initially, you know, well, I told you everything about it clicked with this technique, but that adrenaline portion of it was just so, it was just addictive. And um, I love that it was a dance. I used to dance a lot. I love the mm -hmm. choreography. Like you said, like I am in charge in that studio. That's for sure. I am the conductor of the orchestra in every aspect and every movement that I make they know what I'm talking about. They know what I need. And so it's it's really fun for me. I used to love team sports and I love the physicality. I love the teamwork. I said it's beautiful like a dance. Everybody knows their part. You know what I'm saying. It is part of the big picture of why we love to do it. And that in itself, the making of is probably every artist feels this way, is is mm -hmm. what what they love to do and, and why they do it. So but then, you know, envisioning how it's going to look in the end, and sometimes it's exactly as you think it is, but I think with, with glass, it's, it definitely has a mind of its own, and things can happen that you, you don't predict or you can't predict, especially with some of the finishes or colors that we work with, and incorporating metal or experimentation of what you can do with the medium. You never quite know what you're going to get. I find that thrilling. Um, mm. Not knowing. I mean, it's scary And on one hand, and you're trying something different, and you don't know how it's going to end up. And that's also a thrill. Well, one thing I like about like your technique, for example, is I'm really familiar with how Renee and I work with flow and transparency and and smoothness. And yet you work with glass in a technique where you get texture and weight and there's transparency, but it's not as thin. It's more translucent. And I find the the different ways of working with glass just so cool that that you can achieve that. Yes. That is interesting because, you know, I embrace the imperfections. I embrace things that just happen. I like the bubbles. Mm. <laughs> a glass blower would be like, are you crazy? Um, Blanco would say those were holidays. The bubbles are holidays. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. 
I love the holidays. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I love a good holiday. But I I love the imperfections and actually when you know technically you you get good and you get better and better and better and sometimes I find the freshness of my earlier work when I wasn't quite as technically proficient there's a fluidity that I prefer and I'm now now trying sometimes to get back there reintroduce it back in yeah yeah where it's just a little bit more out of control controlled out of controlness <laughs> mm-hmm. and um so that i i really like that aspect i since you know it's poured in sand it, the glass remembers the mold so it looks like beach glass or you know it was unearthed mm-hmm. and i like that it looks like a relic and that's the reason i chose this way of working, those imperfections for me are so different than most people who work in glass. That that is really exciting for me. The solidity, like how solid it is. You never want that in glass blowing. You want it thin and our teacher kept telling us, Can you can you blow it a little thinner, please? <laughs> <laughs> right. And I'm and like here you're no. celebrating the heft. You're celebrating that, right? <laughs> so it's so opposite. Everything that I do is so opposite. And sometimes I feel like, you know, I so can appreciate what glass blowers are doing and the technical proficiency and and the creativity it's just utterly different to how I work you know like I don't mm-hmm. like perfection and I don't like the way it looks that it's absolutely you know smooth and perfect so it's funny we're working the same medium in it but yet so different <laughs> it is so different I have thought about your work over the years as kind of a feeling of like an artifact that would be, you know, maybe in a dig, an archaeological dig or something. It's like this treasure that was found. And part of it is like what you're talking about, that the surface that is achieved from being poured into a mold in the sand, it creates that look or that effect. Yeah, that's and that's one of the main reasons why I was so attracted to the technique was I thought it had a finish that was utterly unexpected for glass, you know, it just was so different mm-hmm. when I first saw it. And I just love that it looked like it was an artifact or was unearthed. So I, I definitely play that up and try to incorporate that aspect in, in everything that I do. I mean, some bodies of work are not quite as raw, but most mm-hmm. of them, I like that. Like the horses that you're working on, they have a more of a smoothness to them. You know, and the Buddhas and some of the other pieces almost have like a spiritual quality to them. Is that kind of, are you kind of going for an, in your work a, an essence of that? Or for sure. where does that all come from? Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Everything definitely has that uh, aspect for me. The horses are very personal to me and important just because they're, for me, my way to escape and and gives me space I, I just got back into it about seven years ago i started riding again after about 35 years i did it as a kid and um mm. it was my most favorite thing to do but i just never had the time or the way to do it and then my kids showed an interest and so i <laughs> I was like, oh God, don't go Mother up on daughter that horse. bonding. <laughs> I was like, okay, right? if I go up there, I don't think I'm going to get on down. So, and that's what happened. They lost interest, which I was um, okay with because it's pretty pricey. And um, oh, but for I me, you that going to say scary, like <laughs> like scary, uh, it dangerous. Is scary. <laughs> it is that, but you know, that's my life. So, um, but yeah, so that to me, and then I just you know, I, I've been thinking about my horse, what horse am I going to do? And they're so personal and to me, but, um, eventually I got one out, which is what I've been doing recently. And it was inspired by a cave drawing in France. And I thought if I can take a line mm. and turn it into a sculpture, that would be really cool. So yeah, those are definitely for me, very spiritual. And then the butterflies too, they're for sure inspired by my daughters who were interested in anything flying as as babies and kids. They were just looking at butterflies and birds and, you know, wow, I want to fly too. And I just thought, wow, that's such a 
great symbol of of who you can become and and being better. So that was, of course, had to be thrown in the mix. <laughs> and sure. then Buddhas are a very obvious spiritual image that so that many sense. people can relate to, which is why I chose it. It's just one of those images that is relatable to everyone. So it sounds like you you work in imagery that is meaningful, uplifting to to you personally, but then you know it kind of might have a hook for somebody else too. Like it might have broad appeal perhaps, or, or do you think that way or do you think solely on what resonates with you? Oh, that's a question right there. I mean, I think that what university did for me was make me think about what I want to say and what I want to communicate and what's important to me and what, you know, what is it that I want to say without any yeah. commercial cur- commercial side to it. It's just like, that's what what's so great about going to college and university is that it's just, you get in touch with your voice. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, I never quite expected that people would like what I was making during that period in college. I was like, wow. Really? <laughs> you know, I just sure. would get surprised when people wanted the work or liked it enough. I, at first, I was just giving it away. If anybody said they liked it, I was like, oh my here God. It's you, yours. <laughs> here, you like what I'm doing? You know, because it's so pure. It's just like it's your yeah. thing that you're trying to say. And so then I saw that there was commercial appeal. So I was surprised, very surprised. And then you know, what I have found is that it it has to be something that is very pure as far as, as what you want to say and what you want to make. And then I find people will seem to like it when it, it's very pure, like mm, that. Like the authenticity behind it, yes. like coming from a real pure place, you're saying. Yes. But then at the same time, it's hard to not think about the commercial side of it as you're trying to pay your rent and like yeah, you said run a business support your family <laughs> right we have nothing else you know that's just, there's nothing right. other than the art business so there's nothing to fall back on and so i think for me having this business side which i never thought i had you know i was always thought artists mm. are just artists right they call us starving artists like we don't know how to sell what we do Right. And it's that you you have that side of the brain, people say, and a lot of artists do like that's that's all they want to do is just create. But I what I didn't realize is that I actually do have a pretty good business sense. I have no idea where it came from. And mm. I never studied business. I never studied marketing. I never studied any of that. So all of this is just sort of trial and error. And what I found is that you know, even in when I went to um, the graduate school, I told you, and it didn't work out. I said to myself, "Oh, you know, it'd probably be a good idea to work in a gallery because then you would see how the galleries feel and what they're looking for and how it works from the business side." I'm going to go work in a gallery, and that was my just my idea when I didn't know what to do. And it was just like I said, it was just like some this this inherent right idea, and and then I just from there, I I learned many different things from the business side, you know, from Mm -hmm. from how galleries like to work, and then it just gave me a lot of insight, and and I think having this sort of business side is that I I could see very quickly when an idea was commercially appealing like oh okay i just made that horse and it sold at the first show that i put it out in okay and then i start thinking to myself that's good what did i price it at okay noted and i write all this down and then i note the color and i think about all that like after mm-hmm. it's kind of like an after the pure communication like you said like that you want to make it for you. But then quickly the business side of me is looking and analyzing and thinking, okay, Mm. so there was some rightness there. What was that? Or it didn't sell this new idea. 
Was it a busy show? How many people mm-hmm. walk by? What's the price? You know, stuff like that. So I, I'm constantly analyzing those things as well. So it's kind of <laughs> the executive director and me, the marketer, like all that stuff comes in at a certain point. It's all the different hats you wear, right? It's all the different hats. Yeah. So I'm always analyzing and probably overthinking things too much. But I think it's it's a balance that if you, you're not good at, you have to get help with it or else, you know, you'll be the starving artist. If no one sees the work, then yeah, you're just, Mm -hmm. you're going to be a starving artist. But the key is, is okay, how do we get it seen and sold? Getting it in front of people's eyes and observing the reactions because the selling part of it is, is a piece, right? One part. But the conversations and the spark, if it, if it doesn't generate anything, you know, okay, well, that's that's not working, right? <laughs> Whatever the price, if they don't even react to it, right. you know, it's kind of flat, right? Right. <laughs> but there's that other element of they're sparked by it. It's like, okay, now I can work with this idea. This idea hits with a lot of people or something. Yeah. I mean, when I started doing the Buddhas, you know, I was just shocked at the response. But I had probably a thousand ideas connected to it. And Mm -hmm. I have that a lot with a body of work. Like I'll see it this way and then I'll see it that way and I'll see it another way, but I won't explore it unless, you know, I see that there is that connection to the client, you know, do they, they connect with it. And once I saw that there was people were really loving that body of work. I I was doing it a million different ways to make it one of a kind and unique and different different shapes and different colors and sizes and ways and and scale pushing scale. pushing kind of like what kind of installation type way you can use it. I mean, it is. It's once you know you've kind of hit something or touched on something, then it's like the sky's the limit. Yeah, and that's when that's it's it hasn't happened with you know, everything. But when it does happen, I feel like it's it's so nice for me because I I do tend to think in all of these different ways, like you say, with scale and, you know, wall mounted and freestanding and tabletop and, you know, different ways to mm-hmm. communicate the idea. And it's so nice to have that opportunity to be able to really explore. So when it comes to your work, if somebody were to ask you, like, who you are as an artist, you know, we have words that kind of jump up, you know, like, I think I'm a glass artist, or you kind of check a bunch of boxes, you know, what, which is the one that kind of resonates the most? Is it sculptor? Is it glass artist? You know, what is it exactly for you? I think it's sculptor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I just find that that is what it is, is sculpture. That's always been what has excited me is sculpture. I mean, I look at it recently, I'm like, maybe it's mixed media because of the metal stands that I'm, you know, designing and creating and then the metal inclusions. So I don't even know what to call it. You know, I've been in shows Mm -hmm. where I have, you know, just thought of it as sculpture and then glass people will be like, but it's glass. And I'm like, yeah, it is glass. And it does, you know, get a lot of its beauty from it Let's just say glass. I like it when you apply in sculpture, let's just say. Because <laughs> you, you leave a few spaces for us other glass <laughs> contemporaries. <laughs> it's funny. Sometimes I don't even get in the glass category, you know, on the other wow. side of it. And I think to myself, well, maybe that's because it's coming from somebody who's a glass blower, And they're looking at this thing and they're like, what the heck is this? And I, 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 you know, it has nothing to do with me. So it's funny how it works. And then I'm like, well, maybe it really isn't glass. It's sculpture or mixed media. And so that's where I'm, I'm working that out for myself. Like where do right you now. fit, right? Where do I fit? No, I, I think fit anywhere. <laughs> well, and it's true. I think if somebody is not, let's say, versed in making glass, um, they might not know all the different ways you can can use it. And glass sand casting is a rarity, as you've pointed out. So they might look at it and go, wait a minute, but that could be a good thing. You know, it's like unique. But if they don't get it, if they think this is what glass is supposed to look like, 
then, you know, it, it's hard to to know how to navigate your way through that. Totally. Yeah. So I'd say sculptor <laughs> would be, you know, I'd say as artist, sculptor, and then as business owner, I'd say entrepreneur because, mm. you know, it's it's a business and it's definitely been a journey, a journey that I have never studied. Like I said, I'm just like you, I'm sure you're figuring it out every step of the way and what works and what doesn't work and, you know, how to survive. But even talking to people on the other artists on the podcast, there are so many different business models. We're not all, it, we show up to a show of, let's say, 150 artists, 200 artists, whatever. Those 150 different artists are operating 150 different ways. You know, you're not getting up in the morning, drinking your cup of coffee, walking into your painting studio no other support staff around you do your paintings, throw them in the back of your, your van and head off to the art fair. You've got more cogs in the wheel to, to do what you have envisioned and what you dreamed up to do. You know, so it, it, we don't all have that same kind of layout. Yeah, it's, it's been an interesting journey because, you know, after college and the way that it's promoted is, is more of you know, you should be in museums, you should be in galleries. Mm. And that's what an artist does. So that was the path that I went out on was getting with the galleries and getting the museum shows. And that was all difficult because how do you get the museum shows without the experience or, you know, with the galleries? And it was just like, it was great. And it was a wonderful road until 2008. And then 2008 came. Everything got redefined then. Yeah. None of my galleries were selling. And I was like, okay, choices here. What am I going to do? Am I going to be a waiter? I, you know, like what, right. what is, what is my- We all feel like we're one step away from being a barista, don't we? I mean, right. Some, even though we've run these businesses selling our art that is so specialized, we all do feel like, well, what am I qualified to do if this isn't here anymore? <laughs> right. And it was funny, right at the time that, you know, my husband lost his job. He was, um, he's an architect and he was doing some property development. So all of that, mm. you know, crashed. He was helping me on the side in the studio. Anyway, he's helping me a lot. And so at that point, I'm like, well, should we just work together completely? And they bring him into the family business, right? Bring him into the business because I was doing very well until 2008. Everything was going great. And then, you know, one of my friends who I met somewhere along the way was like, uh, Marlene, I'm doing, I'm curating this, this um, sculpture garden at this art festival in mm. Coconut Grove. And I was like, with my nose up, you know, I don't do that. I'm, right. The know. schools do that to us, don't they? They they make us they make us feel like those are not a respectable path. The art shows, you know, the, the outdoor art fairs, art festivals, kind of thing. Right, and the galleries make us feel that way. Mm -hmm. And um, so I said, I don't do that. And he's like, Marlena, what's happening? <laughs> are you selling right now? I'm like, no. He's like, <laughs> you could make more money in a weekend than you do all year with one of your galleries or more. And I was mm. like, okay, you have my interest. Right. <laughs> you got me, you got me on making yeah. more money in a year. <laughs> yeah, um, right. So well, worth a shot. Worth a shot. So I did it. And sure enough, I killed it. I made more mm. money in that weekend than I had with a gallery for a whole year. So I was like, wow, okay. Let's get on the phone and find what show, every show that I can possibly do that is a festival that's, and, and then I analyze, this is my business side. I was like, okay, so what made that mm -hmm. successful? It was in a very, very upscale area. There's a, like 100,000 people walk by in, in a weekend. That's huge numbers, you know, so I needed to find you know, plus maybe little did you know that that area is especially in love with glass. So. <laughs> and this was, you know, what almost twenty years ago. So yeah. So then I started. Okay, how do I balance these two worlds that I'm in? Because I'm in this one world, who I know wouldn't appreciate this other world. Mm -hmm. So 
I would just go to an area that I didn't have a gallery in and I'd try a show. So you don't compete with their so I don't compete, compete with, with their collectors. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Plus, I don't, you know, undercut the gallery. So it's the price is the price, you know. So I just make sure it's all the same. And that of course there's discounting in, in galleries. So I would discount this roughly the same amount. And so there, you know, should be real no issue. And I've keep the worlds very separate. You know, I just try to to balance it. But you know, it has been my my savior. It has been absolutely what changed everything for me. And what's so interesting is that, you know, I have a mailing list and that mm-hmm. is probably the biggest thing that, you know, with galleries, they won't give you the name, yeah. um, which makes sense because they're doing the work to close it and they want to be in control of that. And I, I respect mm-hmm. that. Also, if your administration is not good, like I ask everybody, how did they come to find me? And if it's they just saw my work in Gallery A, I definitely refer them back. But it's it's interesting. So I I, I definitely try to keep the two worlds separate. And what's happened recently with the decreasing glass collector base? Every like glass like in every panel that I've ever ever gone to, it's always like they're a dying breed, the glass collectors. And, Mm -hmm. you know, how do we get new glass collectors? It's always a topic. And what's been, and what's been happening for me, which I really love is like, as I said, one of my biggest missions is, is educating people about the studio glass movement. So when somebody comes to a show that I do, and they don't really know, they don't like galleries, they feel intimidated, they don't know about the studio glass movement. Mm -hmm. It's like they get on my mailing list and all of a sudden, you know, they're getting information about all of these things. And I invite them to all of my high-end shows that are at like the Art Basels. Every single person that I've met on the street will be invited to those shows. And what's been happening is that they kind of then start buying through the galleries. They either buy my work or they don't. But you know, I've helped to bring so many clients to those shows and everybody's happy. The gallery is happy because I have a huge mm-hmm. following. I don't really care. It's like the, the client will get whatever they want. You know, they're going to get what they like. It could be mine again, which you hope. But mm-hmm. um, I look at the bigger picture. Yeah. So that's a really good question that I was going to ask you about was how do you keep those worlds separate? except it seems like you really don't. It seems like you found a way to have them work interconnectedly. You know what I mean? Like you have no problem sending a collector to a gallery where you know you're going to get half of what you would have got if they would have came to you directly, you know? Yeah. So you, you want to keep feeding both of those funnels for yourself. Yeah, and I think that I try not to kind of pull back because I think Mm. if you just kind of are free with things, it'll all come back to you. I really firmly believe in that. And Mm. so I honestly, the only people I don't promote the festivals to are my collectors from the galleries, but I don't have their names anyway. Right, right. So if they saw you on the road and that's how you got their name, then you're not competing with your your galleries, you know. So, exactly. Yeah, for sure. And so mm-hmm. it actually is 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 actually good for the galleries because I'm bringing them clients. So, you know, I don't promote it to any of the galleries that I'm doing these festivals. I just kind of keep it on the down low and at the same time they know that I do them because I'm constantly bringing them collectors and and they have to wonder where are these people? How do they know about you? Mm-hmm. You know, I do have a gallery and I do your own gallery. I have my own gallery. Your own yeah. And I advertise a lot in magazines. I advertise in Lux, Architectural Digest, Florida Design. Like I do a lot, especially during COVID. That was, you know, the way that I could get out there because I was not doing any shows, no, nor was anybody else. Thank God for that mailing list because I had somebody to write to and reach out to during the pandemic. I don't know. Right. What other artists did, I really don't. That that's got us all through. That got all, any of us who are still standing. That's what got us through was those contacts 
because they wanted some sense of art and connection with other people, connection with an idea, something that was meaningful. And so we did find that it was scary, but a lot of us came through it. Totally. And, you know, as as far as like, it's super important for me to to ask every time somebody reaches out, where did you hear of me? Because since I am, you know, gallery represented and they are my bread and butter, I try to be very respectful of them. And so if it is somebody that is through a gallery, then I turn it back over and just, you know, sometimes I have to close it and then send the gallery mm -hmm. the money because some people, they now that they're connected to you, they don't want to not be connected to you. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. just, you know, I just try to keep it really honest and clean and, and, um, and then I find just things go better and, and I sell to my list as well. And, you know, it's, it's, it's all fine, I guess is what I would mm -hmm. say. It all works out. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier about your husband, Thomas, when, you know, in 2008, he came into your business of art and now he is a full-fledged part of it all these years, you know? So how would you describe how that transition worked for the two of you? Well, I think it's, you know, it's never easy working with a spouse or it, it potentially could be difficult, but I think that we learned pretty quickly what each one's role was mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. for sure my business and my artwork. Now he is a very, you're the, you're the boss, right? <laughs> yeah. He's a, I'm the boss. And as long as he knows that. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's good. No, he's um he's super creative and mm -hmm. very much an artist. He just chooses to help me. I think he might do some of his own work one one day soon. But oh, um, cool. but it's funny whenever he has influenced my decision, or I was like, oh yeah, I like that, and it kind of went in in more his. I guess less my thought and more his thought, it never sells, which is so fascinating to me about just being true to yourself. Like, you know, even in marketing, and when I talk to people who are into marketing, they're like, you just, you know, the people who are huge on the social media is that because they are just being themselves. And I was like, that's mm. so fascinating because. That that happened to us, you know. It's like whenever mm -hmm. he was like, "Oh, let's do it this way," and I kind of like lessened myself for for thinking that's not really what I wanted to do. But I was like, "Oh, maybe he knows better," and uh, never sold. It's just like it was just mm -hmm. never. And then we realized we're like, "Okay, this is the sign that it's not a collaborative effort. Sure. This is this is my work," and so. He's very, he never gives his, unless I ask an opinion, you know, do you like this better or this better? Mm -hmm. That's fine. But, but we never really creatively go anywhere other than what I think we should be doing. So that's worked out really well. So there, there are some growing pains as far as he's been in charge of his own world and business and stuff like that. An architect is a, is a, a extremely creative field, but it's different. And so Very. to apply uh, to apply that, you know, that experience to what you're doing, maybe that's where some of that that tension came in with with the reaction to the work when maybe you were leaning more on on what his idea might have been, you know, to say, well, let's try it out and see. Yeah, and I thought, you know, I was just a little insecure about my ideas, and and but we we saw that it just funny that they just never sold. And so I, I just thought that, and I said to him, when you do your work and you do, you have your voice, it's important to, to just do that and not, I shouldn't put my input of what I think you should be doing. Mm -hmm. So that's really good. But he has other strong, I mean, he's knowledgeable in so many things that I, I really need his input, like the engineering of some of the larger scale pieces. And you know, cool. right. that is vital to like them withstanding weather, the ones that go outdoors. And so that's where we're really a great team because I have the ideas mm -hmm. 
And then he helps me make them into a reality of, you know, structure. And and now I'm getting pretty good at being able to just suggest what should be done. And then he'll put it in a way that, um, you know, that it translates for, for the welding and he'll put it in a program that is mm-hmm. very, very translatable, which I wouldn't do. So that's where I think we're a great team and he's, He's great with curating, and so am I, and we work well together on that. We usually agree, so we work well together, and then he will drive a lot of the time, and when I'm, I mean, my kids are 14 and 16, so sometimes I'd have to stay back with them when he was driving so that I could mm-hmm. be with the kids and for school and stuff, so it's it's been a, a really great road, you know, having somebody who's who's that supportive and behind you at right there with you the whole way. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. So a lot of us artists work tirelessly to put our voice out there and to, you know, to do what we do and to hopefully like to break through and be seen on kind of a mass scale. And you've actually experienced that with like the national CBS this morning picked you up and, and did like a 10 minute feature on Marlena Rose. Can tell me what that whole process was like for you. Oh my gosh, that was the, I probably that was the height of my career. I I couldn't believe it, but um you know, I had wanted to be on that show. I thought that's one of the few shows that I would fit, you know, of all the mm-hmm. different shows we could we could possibly be on. I just liked it cuz it was good news and usually about artists or animals, <laughs> just right up my alley. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so I, uh, one, a friend of mine who had worked with CBS saw, came to my first solo museum exhibition in, um, what was it, 2007. And she said, mm-hmm. oh, you should be on CBS Sunday Morning. And I didn't know the show, but I researched it. I was like, oh, yeah, I would love to be on that show. And she was she was in with the show because she had helped them find this uh, person that was ended up being an award winning show for them. Mm-hmm. So I had yeah. it in there, and so she she sh- showed them my work and me about me, and they said that they really l- loved the work, and I was definitely CBS Sunday Morning material, but I wasn't far enough along in my career. And so uh, for them, they needed certain criteria for them to do put you on the show. And so they were kind enough to tell her what that was. And it was mm-hmm. what I was doing already, which was the, you know, the very high-end art fairs, like the Art Basel type shows mm-hmm. and being in museum collections and just different stuff like that. So I, I was doing that here and there, but they wanted m- more of that. So once I had more of that, then we reproposed me to the show and they said, yeah, she's, you know, we'd love to do a show on her, but we just did a, a glass artist. And I don't know if it was Paul Stanker. It might've been Paul Stanker. Oh, and, okay. Um, so they weren't going to do a, a glass artist for a while because I guess they vary that up. And then a few years later I had, you know, a lot going on. So they were ready but nothing was happening. They said they wanted to do the show, but then I wasn't getting a correspondent. And so this lady suggested that I, you know, they're really into that sun, that CBS Sunday morning sun is their symbol. Mm. She said, if you wouldn't mind, I mean, it might help our cause if you make that sun for them. So I made, I made the sun, I sent it to them and the executive producer flipped out over it. It just meant a lot to me because, you know, pictures can't really do the work, can never really do the work justice. So he got- I feel that way too. Yeah, with glass, it's so hard to translate. Yeah, because it's a moment and then it's different, another moment because of the light. So when he saw the work, he was just like, oh my God, who is this? And, 
you know, our producer was like, that, that's Marlena Rosa. You said you wanted to have her on the show. And he's like, oh, my God, I want her on the show now. Now. And can I keep, it? And can I keep the sun? <laughs> there you go. And, um, <laughs> They're like, yeah, <laughs> of course. I, of course. And then it was funny because I was they were thinking about putting me on like some, I don't know, it wasn't a, a great slot that was viewed by as many people. And then mm. once he saw the work, it went to their season premiere show. It was um, mm. so it went from nothing to everything. Like I was in between Hillary wow. Clinton and Olivia Newton John, and I couldn't believe what happened. And that to me was just like it, it felt like because he got to really experience the work, and it was it yeah. was, and that made I don't know that just meant so much to me because that's what you hope that people will be moved by your work. Well, there's an energy to it, and once they holding it and in the in the same space with it, you know, it resonates so much more than an image that's being sent to them for sure. So yeah, it it, it transcended. There have been communications for a while. <laughs> that that was what pushed them over the edge. It sounds like totally. And then we got their best correspondent. That we just they flew down. It was like they were there for days at each location, the gallery studio they went to that show that i did the museum show mm. and they so there was three you know diff, four different locations that they came to and um it ended up coming out the end of september 2019 so right before the pandemic and i know right. that that really helped me again it was another thing that helped me survive during that time because of the residuals and what was like the interest that it generated, it kept, yeah. kept going into 2020. Seven million people saw it. And then, you know, we just, my whole website crashed because of all the interest. And it's, there's wow. nothing like that kind of, those numbers. It's just, I had people calling. I still have people calling. I saw you on CBS Sunday morning. And this is now yeah. how many years? And so, yeah, I just, I keep thinking to myself, okay, how do we top that? You know, because there's right. It's like I don't think there's a lot that's out there that that's like that show. So it was it was definitely the biggest thing that that's ever happened to me, and at a really the perfect time. You know, when you think, you know, sixteen years ago when they heard about me, it took you know, but I don't think I could have handled a the amount of eyeballs. I couldn't have handled yeah. the, the volume, which now I'm set up for, you know, I, I can handle a lot. I have a warehouse full of artwork because that's all I did during the pandemic was make stuff. Okay. <laughs> right, right. So I have a lot of inventory right now. And so it was just, it ended up being the right time for it to happen. So I kind of feel like mm. everything happens <laughs> for a reason. I remember when I saw that, that you were getting that recognition and it felt so good. It felt so exciting, even though, I mean, we weren't like on a, you know, we weren't like on a social basis with each other at that point, but I just felt like one of our own is getting recognized and it's such a great story and it's just so exciting. So I remember feeling super happy for you in those moments. So Thank you so much. I got so much incredible support from the community and yeah, but it was um there's nothing like that. I, I wish there was more things that for for us <laughs> like that. <laughs> but yeah, it's they're always looking for really interesting artists. So it it's something that I think, you know, for anybody who's listening, it's it's definitely something to reach for because they're always looking for they need news, right? They need newsworthy, <laughs> interesting people that have an interesting story. So I think it is something for our group. Well, perhaps having an appearance on the Independent Artist Podcast would top your CBS oh, yeah. this okay. morning experience. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm just <laughs> <so with you. laughs> well, Marlena, this has been an amazing talk, and I really appreciate us getting to know each other a little bit more and learning about you and Everything about your process, it's just really, it's a really great talk. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you so much for reaching out. And I hope really more than anything that it helps. I really hope that something I said maybe 
inspire somebody to be an artist and or to continue and not give up? There are so many different ways that you can be an artist. There's so many different entry points, mediums. Our businesses can look different from one another. And, you know, I, I really have enjoyed getting to know your you know, kind of your path into this, you know? Thank you. I mean, for me, I, one of the things that I really enjoy doing is talking with artists, meeting with artists, trying to help artists be artists, because I feel like, you know, everything that we enjoy in life, from movies to theater, to dance, to art, visual arts, it's there, it's created by artists. And Mm -hmm. so we need more artists. And I think that if you're a visual artist or whatever, that's, we have the same problems as every other artist. Sometimes, you know, the path is a little bit more walked. um, And sometimes it isn't. And that's the thing. It's like, if we can help each other, I think it's so important. And I feel that if People want to reach out. I'm really accessible to to talk to. That's one of the things that is important to me to help other artists. So mm-hmm. I appreciate you even thinking about me, and I hope that I helped. Yeah, well, I, I do feel like that this project that Will and I are working on is just that. It is that that kind of like getting over that that barrier or that hump of the I feel passionate about being an artist. And then just having these conversations from people who've done it to not necessarily feel like, well, if I do it like that, then I'll get to where I want to be. But it's to know that that person stuck with it and they found their way through to the other side and they have these successful careers and have happy lives. I mean, aside from the successful career, really what we're doing is we're building a life for ourselves that is meaningful. And that you can do that, that those people who tell us as young kids that being an artist is not a way to make a living, well, we're proving them wrong there. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it is. And it can be, like you say, it's a what you're doing by bringing artists on the show, I think is just helping. And that's so important. And I, I appreciate what you're doing. And I appreciate that you asked me here because it is, it is a business like anything mm-hmm. else actually there's no there's not mysterious thing about it it's you know you can go the gallery route and and pick your gallery as well do that mm-hmm. you know what i mean like right. let them run the business then and them do the business side and the marketing and that's fine that is absolutely fine you know you mm-hmm. have to pick your gallery so that they're honest you know there mm-hmm. there are ways to do it there's So that's the thing is like, you know, when I meet with people, it's also, okay, what is your purpose as an artist? What are your goals? Is it to be recognized? Is it to survive Mm -hmm. off your art? You know, because there's many different reasons Mm -hmm. for doing the art. And you just, once I know who I'm talking to and what, because they could be somebody that doesn't need to make a living. They just want to get out there and then I can help them with that. So anyway. Right. I remember a period in time when Renee and I were kind of finding our way, and we thought that doing the wholesale markets where we would sell to galleries, store-type galleries, and gallery-type galleries, and I got there, and it was such a rude awakening because there were so many different kinds of studio glass artists, and I remember the advice I got from somebody, and they said, you need to make the decision what you want your business look like? Do you want to operate under that threshold of where you have employees doing stuff for you that is on menial tasks or whatever? You know what I mean? That is employable, not in the art creating part, but the other stuff. Or do you want to cross that threshold and and be supporting a staff And for some people, that makes sense. And for other people, staying below that line makes sense. But it's definitely like you can cross that threshold. And if you're not making what you need to with revenue to support the organization, then it can all come apart. So it is definitely kind of like knowing who you are as a business and who you are as a person and how you want your end result to turn out. There's there's no one right way, so to speak, you know. 
Totally. That is so true. And that is something to to think about as an as an artist. <laughs> what type mm-hmm. of artist? How big do you want staff? Like you said, it's all important. Well, I think we've come full circle. This is a great this has been a great time. So thanks so much, Marlena, and so nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Well, take care though. Okay. Thanks. Great talk with Marlena Rose Douglas. Thanks for getting that in this week with everything that we have going on. We are still working through technical difficulties on our our buddy Matt Hemminghouse. Hope to get him on next time coming through. Uh, We will iron that out and figure that out, but something to look forward to coming up. Um, Something that we are not looking forward to uh, as we get older, Douglas, uh, wanted to talk for a second about, you know, just the inevitable health issues that we all kind of deal with as as the the shows kind of pile up on us and and the road gets gets heavy on our limbs but um man we've had a couple of couple of hard things to deal with uh, as a community these past couple of weeks we have we've had a couple of friends who've had some health problems we've got people recovering from the hurricane that's come through yeah, so yeah the storm it's a big one too mm-hmm. I'm glad you mentioned that um Yes, yeah, set us up. You started a GoFundMe for a couple of those friends of ours, and and I'll let you let you talk a little bit on that one. Past guest of ours, Oliver Schnorr, now Oliver Hample, jeweler. If you remember back his talk where he had the awful accident with the um, circular saw onto his hand, he recovered from that, and you would think that is all the turmoil someone's going to need in a lifetime, but he found himself in the hospital about a month ago yeah, and he had to have a double brain surgery oh, and God. he's coming back from it, but they had to go with a surgeon who was out of their network for insurance because oh, they were getting conflicting advice on how to save his life. Right. So I'll drop his GoFundMe in the episode notes, read over his story, hear what he went through. And if you're so inclined to, to donate, please do. And, um, yeah, and there's some other people out there that will drop their their GoFundMe's into the episode notes as well, so you yeah, can read about Yeah, I was going to mention one. Um, you know, our, our good friend Amy Lamsberg, who is uh, a mm-hmm. board member of NAIA and has done so much for our community, really took a massive hit during um, the the latest hurricane. Her home, uh, God, it's still under what seven, eight trees minimum. I saw this thing. It looked like, you know, when, when the wind blows and you have tall grass in your yard and it kind of blows flat, that's what the pine trees look on top of her home. So, Mm. um, that's another important one. She's, like I said, not just a a dear friend, but a, a good friend to the community as well. And all the work that she's done for the board of NAIA. So I'm not sure if there is a GoFundMe on that one, but they had been posting her Venmo. I know it's in the works, so I will read out and make sure it gets in the episode notes. And and then there's also Carol Grywe, who also suffered from a, a, a stroke. So she is part of the team with Art in the Pearl in Portland there, who's putting on that event. So a lot of you who just did Art in the Pearl are going to know that she's not at the show because she's recovering. So keep all these people in your positive thoughts and send them Good help if you can. Yeah, look out for each other out there. Absolutely, you, know? you never know what's going to happen, and and even if it's just uh, just just some kindness to do that, whether it's it's just a, a helping hand or or a kind word, it, it it means a lot to to these folks and these valuable members of our community that that do so much for us. Well, as I look at the time here, uh, Will, it's probably supper time for you and bedtime for me. So <laughs> um, I will catch you in a couple of weeks. We'll see you in Sounds St. Louis. Good. All right, bye. Bye. This podcast is brought to you by the National Association of Independent Artists. The website is naiaartists.org. Also sponsored by Zapplication. That's zapplication.org. And while you're at it, find us on social media and engage in these conversations. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast to be notified when we release new episodes. Oh, and if you like the show, we'd love it if you would give us your five-star rating and offer up your most creative review on your podcast streaming service. See you next time.